Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, expanding military operations in northern Gaza while hostage talks continue. A look at what's behind vastly different war coverage from the Israeli and U.S. press. Plus, a warning from an expert on the close relationship between Hamas and Qatar and how October 7th affected many members of a Bedouin Arab-Israeli family, one of whom saved lives at the Nova Music Festival. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl. Hostage talks are set to start again, but Israel is drawing a hard line. Either Hamas frees the hostages by Ramadan, or the IDF will destroy the terrorist last stronghold in Rafah. And as Paul Strand reports from Jerusalem, details continue to spill out about Hamas's brutal sexual assaults against Israeli women on October 7th. Israel's war against Hamas started months ago in the north of Gaza, but the military says it's still expanding its operations there. Troops were seen running and firing as they made their way building to building. And as the fighting continues, Israeli negotiators are headed back to stalled talks aimed at getting the release of up to 130 hostages that Hamas may still hold captive in Gaza. Israel's returning to talks because mediators say Hamas has softened its demands, like a total end to the war. Even so, Israel's goal is to keep going till it has permanently ended the threat of Hamas. Israeli War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz has repeated his demand that Hamas release all the hostages before the March 10th start of Ramadan. If they don't, he says the IDF will launch its offensive even during that Islamic holy month into its last major target. That's the city of Rafah, which right now is packed with more than a million Palestinian refugees who fled earlier fighting in other parts of Gaza. Meanwhile, more information on that new report to the United Nations showing horrific sexual violence committed by Hamas against Israeli women and girls October 7th. The head of the group issuing the report told CBN's Julie Stahl the brutal attacks included gang assaults and shooting women in their private parts. It was systematic, planned, intentional sexual violence atrocities, very sadistic and very brutal. It's very hard to see that these kind of things happen and, and the world denies, don't, doesn't care, doesn't believe. In and in areas where Israeli forces have eliminated the terrorist threats, some of the tens of thousands of Israelis who evacuated many dozens of communities close to Gaza after Hamas's deadly attack are preparing to return to their homes. Many were too terrified of another invasion or continued barrages of missiles from Gaza, but both threats appear nearly over. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was dealing with the same issue of getting Israeli evacuees back to their homes, but this time in northern Israel, near the border with Lebanon. Many fled the almost daily shelling and drone attacks launched by Hezbollah terrorists since October. Netanyahu was visiting troops on the Golan Heights and promised an end to the Hezbollah threat and safety for Israeli residents. We will achieve it in one of two ways, by military means, if required, in a political way, if possible. Meanwhile, he's presented his war cabinet a plan for Gaza after the war. It includes a complete demilitarization of Gaza, except for Israeli troops manning a buffer zone between Gaza and Israel. It calls for de-radicalizing Gaza's Palestinians. Polls show they, by a vast majority, support Hamas's goals of wiping out the nation of Israel and its entire Jewish population. The post-war plan also envisions a takeover by local Palestinians experienced in governing, but only if they're not connected to terrorist groups. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, what's behind the vastly different headlines describing the same war? When you look at the war coverage coming from the U.S. and Israel, it can seem like journalists are reporting on two different situations. Our correspondent, Paul Strand, got with Middle East analyst John Waggy to hear his take. John, these days we read the Jerusalem Post, and sometimes it seems like we see headlines that are almost contradictory, say, about what America's thinking about the war in Gaza and what Israel's thinking, Netanyahu is saying. Is this happening? Are we seeing, like, two separate worldviews happening right in front of our eyes? Absolutely, Paul. And recently, I was looking at one newspaper, the Jerusalem Post, saw five headlines that, in the headline itself, it told the story of what was going on. Netanyahu saying, 
There's no negotiating with Hamas now. They're delusional. The hostage families were saying, you must negotiate with Hamas. The Biden administration saying a Palestinian state is acceptable, necessary. Israel's an isolationist. And Netanyahu saying, no dice until this war is over. I mean, it was, but it was captured in the headlines, and it was fascinating to me to see that. Are you seeing a real divide between America and Israel when it comes to this? Absolutely, and it's been there all along. I mean, even during the hugs between Biden and Netanyahu, even before then, uh, there were battles over judicial reform and all that sort of thing. But when the war hit, it was almost immediate. The United States was friend of Israel, always will be a friend of Israel. And the Israelis were, we understand American concerns, but we're going in, in it to win it. And actually, the Israelis have kept two their, their pledge all along. They are continuing to work to defeat Hamas, but something crept up on the American side, and that is the political election of 2024, when Biden started to realize that huge portions of his base, the leftist progressive base, the foot soldiers in any political campaign, were abandoning him. And that's when the pressure really started to ratchet up on, on Israel. Yeah, and it, and I think people said that you know Israel will probably have everybody on their side for about ten days, and it, and it feels like that's about how long it lasted. And I'm I'm wondering, is the other side there winning the information war in a way that the Biden administration feels so much pressure from what's really not that many people in America? They they feel so much pressure. Israel does, but are they caving at this point? No, and it did last. This this kind of honeymoon thing during the war lasted longer than ten days, really. But the the rhetoric started to shift little by little, and to the point where you have now, uh, we are negotiating a Palestinian state with or without you, and Israel saying no deal on a Palestinian state, and it's unanimously approved by the cabinet and the Knesset and everybody else. So Israel's pretty, pretty much still of one mind. They'll continue to have the platitudes about we're no better friend, uh, allies to the end, but uh, that, that rift is there, and I think it's there to stay through the foreseeable future, at least the spring. Well, thank you for your insights. John Waggy, our CBN Middle East News Analyst. Thanks, Paul. The book of Ezekiel refers to a watchman on the wall, someone who looks out for the safety of the city and warns of imminent danger. Yigal Carmon from Memory, the Middle East Media Research Institute, is one of those watchmen. For decades, his organization has publicized what is being said in the Arab world and helped the West understand its thinking. Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell sat down with him to hear about the historic connection between Qatar and Hamas. Yigal Kamran, thanks for joining us. You're the founder of Memory. It's really had an impact in the Middle East and around the world. You just wrote an article. Tell us about that. I wrote this article as an attempt to make sense of American policy in the region. And the sad fact is that it doesn't make sense at all. America is building its presence on Qatar. And Qatar is the cornerstone for American policy to uh, move ahead eventually with a peace process, with an agreement about a deal about the um, hostages. And this cannot happen. President Biden may need it uh, in general for his re-election, but the combination of Qatar as the cornerstone of his policy and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and Israel and Egypt is an impossible formula. It doesn't connect. It's actually a prescription for an explosion. Why? Because Qatar is a Trojan horse in his, in his policy in Washington, in his administration. Qatar is an Islamist uh, uh, sponsor of terrorism. Uh, they belong uh, not to the Western bloc, not to the American bloc, but to the opposite, to the Russian-Chinese bloc, to Iran. Qatar is uh, the sponsor of Hamas. They built it from a little organization to a semi-military uh, empire, so to speak. And uh, they keep uh, um, building it and keeping it uh, uh, to live and to be able to fight as well and to be able to host, uh, hold the hostages. And uh, they are an adversary, a sworn adversary 
to Saudi Arabia, to the Emirates, to Egypt. Why, why would you think the administration is trying to work with Qatar? I can't uh, um, figure out the reasons except for ignorance. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, hoping uh, for the impossible, that is a human <laughs> condition. Uh, humans may hope. You don't expect that from people of state, uh, experienced and knowledgeable. But this is what they are doing. So is Qatar Hamas and Hamas Qatar? Qatar is Hamas and Hamas is Qatar. Qatar built Hamas from a tiny organization that took over by force the um, uh, rule of Gaza in the uh, end of 2006, 2007. They took it by force and became, with the money that Qatar uh, gave them, billions of dollars over the years, uh, they became a tiny empire, military empire. Qatar is the Trojan horse. A, it's a ticking bomb in the hands of the administration. And they hope to build a peace deal with Qatar. How is that going to happen? Uh, this is all contradictions above contradictions above contradictions. And in reality, since they give them a place, since they give them a status, they, namely the administration, is giving a status to Hamas, the war will continue. There won't be any day after. Even after 32 Americans were killed in October 7 and 8 are still hostages, Qatar did nothing to uh, rescue even the American ones. Only if you remove the Trojan horse out of the picture. Totally. That is the only hope. And it exists. And then, only then, there will be a day after. And only that way a regional war can be avoided. Well, Yigal Kamran, thanks for your insight analysis. Thank uh, you. Born over decades of experience. Thank you. Thank you. Still ahead, a Bedouin Arab family reeling from the effects of October 7th and an extraordinary story of heroism. On October 7th, the hostages taken by Hamas included more than Israeli Jews. There were Israeli Arabs and foreign workers among them. Here's the story of one Israeli Bedouin Arab family for whom October 7th was a day of tragic losses and heroism. 27-year-old Bashir al-Zayadna, a Bedouin Arab and law student, saw his life turned upside down by the events of October 7th. I'm the spokesman of my family here in uh, Tel Aviv in the uh, family's headquarters and the family's forum uh, of the uh, hostages. I had four family members kidnapped on the 7th of October and held as hostages as well. Bashir's uncle Yosef and three of his children were working at the dairy in Kibbutz Cholit when Hamas attacked. At seven and a half in the morning, they were captured. We saw photos, videos of them being held by Hamas. Very hard images, very hard footage. Hamas released one son, Bilal, and daughter Aisha after nearly two months because they were both under 18. They told us that they had almost no food. They've told us that they have been staying deep down in the tunnels. They've told us that although the guards of Hamas spoke Arabic and they speak also Arabic, they never shared the world together, never spoke together. All four of them were staying in the same room and their guards gave four of them each one a Quran book, which is the Islamic holy book. It was very hard for them to stay in captivity. Yosef and his son Hamza remain captive. The father, who's 53 years old, who is still held as hostage in Gaza, has diabetes, and we know that he doesn't take his medications. Hamza al Ziadna is 22 years old, also still held as captive in Gaza by Hamas. He has migraines, and he also doesn't take his medication. Unfortunately, the tragic impact doesn't end there. I have a cousin of mine whose name is Abdurrahman. He was murdered on the 7th of October by Hamas. 
was murdered, murdered alongside his wife, who happened to be a Jew. They believed in coexistence and they could coexist together. They just fell in love and, and got married. They were just having fun in Zikim Beach. They stayed the night there and we woke up with a very sad message of them. Bashir, who lived in Sterot, wasn't there that day. Luckily, I went to my mother's place the weekend it happened. I was in Rahat on the 7th of October. And now I am in Tel Aviv because I have been evacuated from Gaza envelope to the center of Israel. Another relative became a hero. I'm an Arab Bedouin. I'm proud to be Israeli. I personally saved the lives of 30 people on that Black Sabbath. Yosef al Zayadna, a bus driver, provided transportation at the site of the Nova Music Festival. He tells CBN News he had dropped off passengers there earlier and planned to pick them up the afternoon of October 7th. Around 6 a.m., the phone rang. I saw on the phone the name Amit Adar, the guy that had ordered the transport. He said, Yosef, save us. I said, what is it? He said, there's a mess, alarms, rockets. There are terrorists. I didn't think twice. I started my car and drove there. Despite rockets, gunfire, and terrorists, he successfully rescued 30 people, packing them into his 14-seat bus. All the young people that are brought back, thanks to God, they returned whole. No one was murdered. No one was kidnapped. Later, Hamas found Yosef's phone number on Facebook, called, and threatened him. For me, we're all human beings. There are good and there are bad people. And I did this as a person, a human being. In the end, we're one people, and this is our country, and we must live together. This is a, a miracle that he went there and got out without any damage. Bashir says the reaction of Israelis following the attack truly surprised him. We saw people in Israel from all parts of the Israeli society come together, stand together, and fight together, and help each other. It doesn't matter if they were Jews, Arabs, Christians, Druzi, Muslims, liberals, Orthodox Jews. You saw all Israelis come together and behave like one big society that lifted one another. Bashir says he's never viewed Hamas as representing Muslims or Palestinians. To him, it's a radical terrorist organization. That's one reason Bashir believes there's still hope for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. We should find the common things that we cherish, and we should find uh, focus on them, and we should uh, find a way to, to heal our wounds and also fight for a better future for both of us, Israelis and Palestinians. What happened on the 7th of October should never happen again, and what is happening right now in Gaza should also never happen again. Bashir says he wants people to pray for the war and violence to end and for peace in the world. Coming up, a musical cry from the heart for the waiting to be over and the hostages to come home. As the war continues, all of Israel continues to feel the burden of the hostages still in captivity in Gaza. Israeli songwriter Stefan Michaescu is one of the many artists giving expression to that frustration. He spoke to us in our studio about his music video, Waiting. <laughs> Stefan Michaescu, welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I'm, uh, I'm Jewish, born in Romania. Uh, me and my family uh, made Aliyah when I was four years old from Bucharest. And uh, mm -hmm. we've been in Israel ever since. Um, eventually, as time passed and I grew up, I moved to Jerusalem. I have my family here, my beautiful wife and four kids. So now you have written an amazing song that is a powerful song for this time in Israel's history. Yes. It's called Waiting. Waiting for what? What is the song about? Why did you write it? We're waiting for every single one of the men and women and sons and daughters and fathers and mothers to be returned to us from Gaza, from Hamas. The hostages. Yeah, the hostages. <laughs> This song is actually a cry for the return of the hostages 
Of course, as human beings, there are some limitations, but we look to God for the return of our hostages. That's why I'm saying we're waiting because there's nothing really else to do than to wait mm -hmm. in a situation such as this, to trust God with all these men, women, and, and, and sons and daughters, and fathers and mothers, to be able to be returned to us. So what kind of a reaction have you had from people about the song? A friend of mine who did the mixing and the mastering of the song, the night that I released it, released it on uh, YouTube, he contacted me. He sent me a voice message and he said, Stefan, I've been watching this over and over, and every single time I watch it, it leaves me one in silence and two in tears. And in that mix is also the presence of God. Other reactions that people have had have been very similar to that, <laughs> where they're basically left in a crying mess. Honestly, I believe that this is why the song was created, is to give people a voice, just like I had a voice in this song. <laughs> I believe that people don't know how to cry because of something like this. It, they become numb, and it is honestly my prayer that they can actually release themselves and not try to be strong. Mm -hmm. And in that place of lack of strength, that they can actually trust God, trust the Father for the release of all those who are still hostages in Gaza. And oh. until then, we wait. Just like thousands showed up at the Wailing Wall a few weeks back because they ran out of answers and they went to the one place that they knew that they could cry to, hoping for an answer, um, which is right before they're gone. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Stefan, for joining us. And thank Absolutely. you so much for writing this powerful song. I'm honored. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And please continue to pray for the safety of the IDF soldiers and all those caught in harm's way and for the return of all the remaining hostages. And remember, the God who's watching over Israel and you and me neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.